Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to EU TV. I have the late, great pleasure today to talk about the future in urology. And I have an esteemed uh, panel here with me. It's Vandy Jarrett. She is the director of the European Association of uh, the Cancer Leaks, summarizing several cancer leaks in the different countries in Europe. So, warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We have uh, Giovanni Cacciamani from the US. He's the director of uh, the AI unit in Los Angeles, and as well an associate professor in neurology and radiology. So, warm welcome to you as well. Thank Joining you so much for, for having me here. Hot topic. And then we have Christian Gratzke from Germany. He's the chairman of the urology department in Freiburg, Germany. Thank you very much for joining us here as well. Thank you for the invitation. The topic of our meeting today here is about the future of urology. Probably in many meetings we have, this is part of it. But I think right now, currently, there are a lot of new things coming up, especially artificial, artificial intelligence. And it's very likely that this is going to show up uh, more intensively in the near future and really changes our ways, how we deal with our patients, how we deal with our technology, the way we do surgery, the way we decide. Um, so, Joe, what is your feeling about artificial intelligence here during the meeting? What are the main takebacks from you for, for you for, for on this topic? Well, you know, the very first thing that we have to say is that AI is not a new thing. Uh, the entire AI stuff started uh, almost 72 years ago with Alan Turing. And uh, right now, AI seems to be the baby on the block, right? So, urology has been always in position to try in a new uh, technology. It's a techno-driven specialty, from lasers to robotics, and AI is not an exception, right? And uh, AI can be used, uh, at least the, the post potential application of artificial intelligence uh, are literally thousands, from image recognition that can be used for radiological images to pathological images. Studies are showing that the performance of uh, the machine learning technology in the technique, for example, prostate cancer is close to 0 0.86, which is pretty impressive. You know, uh, the other, and you know, that actually can uh, reduce the workload, keeping the workload, improving the performance. An example is uh, uh, when, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that all of us has the chance to sometimes to ask an opinion uh, of one of our radiologists for a, a radiology report that was done uh, outside. Well, technically with AI, this could potentially be just the past. If we can actually standardize the way the radiological report, pathological report, or uh, any kind of report can be standardized, we don't need, uh, you know, this kind of stuff anymore. Surgery is another potential application. Uh, evaluation of the performance in real time is the new key. In the same way that we are providing uh, feedbacks when we go to restaurants. The very first thing is that you go to the restaurant where the reviews are better. If we have a system that unbiased and uh, real time can catch the performance of the surgeon, then patient can actually can read through this thing and actually decide in which is the surgeon that better meet their expectations. This is just a few of the samples that are literally around the corner for being a new reality. Imaging is obviously something we regular use in, in surgery to plan our surgeries, understanding where we need to go, what we need to take out. And, and th there are now what we call the digital twins yeah. helping us to have a look at what we are going to operate on upfront. And we might integrate those into the metaverse, having like a completely artificial environment that, that would give us the possibility to simulate the 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 procedure and maybe being better prepared and doing a better job. What do you see like for? I really believe that digital later? twins are an excellent way for uh, training uh, our surgeons uh, in, uh, uh, or just for training for young surgeons or also for uh, training ourselves in uh, the case that could potentially be challenging the day after. Uh, if I see, how I can see well, digital uh, twins are in my opinion a little bit far from being reality because uh, require a lot of effort before the surgery for making it happen. AI also in this case can be the perfect ally because AI can uh, out making a, an automatic uh, uh, pathway for extracting information and making, making the digital twin without uh, impacting on the burden of us as physicians or other technicians. But yeah, uh, that is the real future. Christian, in Freiburg, do you have any experience with these uh, new technologies available to analyze pathology slides or, or imaging or, or get into this uh, preparing out of the augmented reality maybe for surgery? Yes, we do. And uh, we're especially looking at the fact whether or not AI can eventually replace uh, clinical trials in a way. And that goes in the same direction that you mentioned now uh, with the twins. Um, I think what's most important is the fact that AI is only as good as the database that exactly. it's actually based on. Mm -hmm. 
So what I'm usually concerned with or surprised is, is the fact that everybody is collecting data, such as us in Freiburg, but everyone else is too. So I think uh, combining that data with other centers would make a lot of sense to actually augment database that you have to actually improve the AI and then the results will be better. Right now, there are so many centers uh, working on AI specific projects in any field like imaging, clinical trials, etc. cetera, uh, but there's no combined effort. So I usually think that's a common problem, right? But I think uh, especially in this field, working better together would tremendously improve the field. That, that is one of the aims of the EAU to set up the data hub, the evidence yes. hub, to, to generate a big data bank where you get high quality data collected in order to get beyond what the clinical trials are actually providing, which is okay. always like an ideal scenario, which rarely has something to do with the patient we see every day. We might see on Monday or Tuesday when we're back at home. Um, so that for sure is something where artificial intelligence and the analysis of these big data sets that will be generated will at a certain time point improve uh, the management of our patients. Right. What is your point of view on, on these initiatives to generate data banks, gather data together in order to have a look what really is happening on the, on the real world in a community setting, in an academic setting, or even in, a, in an outpatient clinic uh, yeah, setting? So, so if I can bring in the perspective representing the patients. Um, so we're the Association of European Cancer Leagues. We're cancer leagues around Europe. Um, cancer.eu is our website. So we don't only deal with patients, but we deal with the whole gamut, prevention, um, access to medicines and research. And in the area of artificial intelligence, we've been really looking at the issue around patient privacy, the, the rights. Um, as Christian, you rightly said, It's all based, the AI is based on data. So garbage in, garbage out. And right now uh, at the EU level, you have the European Health Data Space and you, we've seen the GDPR where we're collecting information um, from patients, from clinicians. And the patients are a bit, have always been a bit wary because they want to know, okay, where is the information going to go to? It, yes, it's you know sharing across borders and they're a bit nervous about that because They want to know where it's going, and that's also, that's really not clear. And so if a patient, if a group of patients is not willing to share the data, so that means that's not data, that's data that's going to be excluded from the AI. So when you're doing a diagnosis from the clinician's point of view, um, you're not looking at specific data that, you know, we're talking, especially we're talking about rare cancers. How do you pull that? Because mm -hmm. with rare cancers, you really need reference networks to be able to make that function yes. properly. Um, so I think, so, so for... From the patient's perspective, you know, the future of urology, I think uh, everyone's very happy that AI is here because it's going to make things better. But then we're also concerned about the ethics around it. If a patient is wrongly diagnosed, um, they were then found to be in stage four and they said, okay, but it should, you know, the, the clinician, my urologist should have caught this. And then the urologist might say, I was using this platform. I was, you know, AI was helping me. And so who do you, who is at fault there? So these are the issues that we're looking at the European level for the patients. Um, what are the rights, the privacy rights to data? And then if something goes wrong, and then also from the clinician's point of view, then what do you do? Um, if I can just also say one more thing regarding researchers, because with the European health data space that is now um, happening at the EU, and also we had the GDPR, it gave a lot of headaches to all the researchers. Researchers who are doing, working with data, there were a lot of, let's say, um, they were not harmonized interpretation of the European, of, of the GDPR. So in some countries they said, no, we're not allowed to use this data. And in some countries they are. And then how do you share that cross border? And then there are patients who says, no, but I am willing to share my data, but I'm not sure where it's going. So I think there are a lot of issues to be, you know, addressed, but I think we also need a harm, a good harmonization of the interpretation of what should happen across the countries in the EU. So, so there obviously is a conflict of interest between the data protection, make sure that uh, the data remains where it is and the patient personality is hidden in there. And the need that we have to analyze this data and to see what happens actually really with the patients in, in our data. And then practice. for the patient to understand exactly what's going to happen with their data, you know, yeah. um, the, the how, and the clinician talking to the patient, how are they going to explain so, so that? What is the role of the leaks then to uh, moderate in between the two groups, yeah. the data analysts and the data 
generator, if you yeah. want. Yeah. So. so, so the council leagues, they are, I would say, the direct channel to the general public right. in all the countries. And so, when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, they tend to go immediately to the league and they say, you know, I've been diagnosed with cancer, and then so they provide kind of support. And so the leagues would have to see the the rules, the legal rules in the country, and then help them navigate yeah. around that. And then also to pull that information, maybe cross-border with other leagues as well. And at the EU level, we provide that platform for all the council leagues to work together, to have a dialogue, to be informed of what is happening at the EU level so that the patients know their rights as well. Christian, we have a dedicated session looking at ChatGPT. Hmm. Um, become public a few months ago, or maybe a year, a year and a half ago, that definitely is something that will change the way how we publish and how we present our data. You being editor-in-chief of European Urology Focus, what is your feeling about how AI, artificial intelligence, will change the ways how we publish? And then in general, how do you see publishing science in the future will change and will become uh, a new way of, of, of presenting data. Thank you for this question. So I think um, a publication is about collecting data of as good quality as you can and getting out the message. And this will stay the same. I think um, the, the way we assemble data uh, has worked for many years and that's uh, you know evidence-based medicine as we, as we know it. But the way we transport those data and disperse the message to our readers will change dramatically. The way we look at publications will change. I personally don't think the impact factor will play a major role. It's more about uh, whether or not patients and physicians actually read your articles. It's not about how many times this is cited, but the impact on society is what really matters. That's my strong belief. <clears throat> so um, there are many factors around this. You mentioned the chat GPT. Um, this is a problem for us right now because it's new and uh, this is not forbidden, right? So people are allowed to use it and that's fine. But you then realize that uh, some authors submit papers that are written by uh, Chat GPT and you can tell. Now, these systems are getting better, so it's going to be increasingly hard to tell whether or not this is written by a machine or by a person. Um, so sometimes little mistakes are actually good. Um, so we need to cope with this, um, but I think um, we will find a way. I'm not concerned with this. Um, the other issue of you know, scientific fraud around using artificial intelligence systems for publication is of concern. Uh, as much as that you know, idea is growing, the more challenges we will be facing, but I think we'll, we'll manage that. Now, when it comes to publications in general, because you asked me about the future publications, uh, obviously, we need to be able to disseminate that message in different ways. So um, social media platforms have become increasingly important. You know, you know, Instagram, I am too old for that, but TikTok, Instagram becomes more and more useful. Even if an author portrays uh, the message of her or his article in 10 seconds or 30 seconds, this is going to increase the awareness and then people might go to the platform your homepage and actually read the article. So we need to be more active and more creative how we actually transport our messages. Because right now, I've been doing this for six years and we've been looking at quality of articles mainly, but not so much at the way we're actually dispersing the messages. We have the GU podcast now uh, that's run by Declan Murphy. You're a part of this. Um, so there's a lot of activity to get the message across in a better way. And don't you think that the availability of ChatGPT nowadays, indeed, to, to write up a paper, which is as a formality, is not something that uh, democratizes the possibility to publish. I mean, the native speakers are clearly in advance. They have no problems in writing up an article in English. But in a country where, where English might be less well taught, it might be a barrier to publishing. Don't you think that the, the possibility to have II helping you with the formality will help to get data also from other countries that, that might generate also high quality data, but they were unable for the time being to get into the English speaking environment? I fully agree. I mean, I'm not a native speaker myself, um, so I, I know this problem. Um, what I think uh, chat GPT is actually good for is if you start from scratch, you're sitting in front of a white piece of paper, uh, the system will help you to start somewhere. Then you have a pattern that you can modify according to your needs. But you shouldn't use the text that the machine is giving you to submit to a journal. 
you should use it as a, a template and then start from there. And that can help you a lot. And I agree with you. However, when you say about the native English um, you know, speakers and how to improve the system, there are so many ways nowadays to send your manuscript for little money to somebody who reads this and improves this. So if you really wanted to do that, well, the there's other ways than ChatGPT. But um, I'm not saying it's better. Just think we have to get used to how we use it um, and then judge later. That's my, my take. If I can just jump in and say something about that, because um, I, I review manuscripts all the time. And it is true that sometimes I can already tell, like, this is what's... Yeah. But I think, in fact, it's helping the non-native um, countries, non-native English countries, break into this. Because, you know, before they would only be able to write something in their own language. And then they said, okay, I can never submit this. Mm. But then now it's giving them an opportunity. They yeah. said, I can actually submit it. Mm. And then, you know, when you know, when you review a manuscript, you will say, okay, we need, you know, more English editing or something like that. But I think had we not, if, if, if the, the authors did not have ChatGPT, if they didn't have Google Translate even before, I don't think they would have had the confidence to submit something. So I think that we're going to see more publications coming out from non-native English speakers. And I'm really, I'm really pleased to see that it is, I, I do already see a lot of it coming out from non-native English countries, like Eastern Europe especially. If I may add one point on this, uh, this is excellent and I totally agree with you. On the other side, uh, we have to use it and we have to see or to regulate the use of ChatGPT in the academic publishing. Yeah. Uh, chances are that people are going to use it with malintention, writing pieces of the manuscripts. I am working with uh, VM Cabana, who actually is uh, like a detective in uh, finding uh, uh, what he called uh, the uh, fake papers, fake manuscripts. Yeah. And over the last six months, we found out 157 publications, even coming also from Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, that has That's what crazy. we call the ChatGPT fingerprints. Exactly. So, and that actor is telling you that if uh, a manuscript with a regenerated response or as an AI model, I can do this in the middle of the discussion, it means that the entire process uh, failed to spot it. That's uh, the first thing. On the other side, as uh, uh, Krista was mentioning, we don't have right now uh, technologies that are able to spot if a text is generated by perplexity from ChatGPT or any other large language model. So to this end, together with the editors in chief of the most prestigious journals and uh, representative from COPE, WAME, uh, the European Society of Academic Publishers, plus uh, um, Equator Network uh, and the COPE, we are putting together what we call the Kangaroo Guidelines. Kangaroo stands for ChatGPT, Generative AI, Large Language Model Accountable Use. Right now, we have already 9,000 academics all over the world from 195 countries, uh, 27 academic disciplines that are working together with the, in the largest DeFi consensus ever done for nice. providing the guidelines on the ethical use of use of ChatGPT, Large Language Models in general, to prevent what happened in the 90s with the photo manipulation. And, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to have those guidelines uh, published in nature uh, by good. the end of this month. Very good. Nice. Mm. Yeah. One last point. We probably cannot talk about the future without looking at sustainability, sustainability, global warming, the carbon footprint. Christian, what take you home from this meeting here? What do you do in your daily practice to have a, a look and improve sustainability inside of urology for the years to come? I thank you for this question because, uh, you know, I'm, I was never like an environmental activist in my life, but I, I think I changed a little bit. We just issued um, a themed issue on sustainability with uh, Michael Liebman from Yale University. And I read those articles with great interest. And there's two articles I would like to mention because they're really sticking out. One is the fact that that's so striking only by switching off your electronic instruments when you go home and then switching them on in the morning when you come back reduces your costs, but the impact on the environment is huge because the energy you're consuming is significantly less. In Germany, in our country, healthcare um, is the, uh, the biggest uh, consumer of energy in the whole country. If everyone was doing that you know, in office-based um, systems, but also in the hospitals, you would have actually a significant impact on the environment. And so why not doing that? The other point is the fact that um, there have been so many um, trials looking at single use uh, versus reusable instruments. One is a trial that we published on cystoscopes. And you would think that uh, the reusable ones are actually much better for the environment. 
And there is an agency that works in industry um, that looked at both systems and found that, uh, and that was without any doubt, the uh, single-use instrument was much better for the environment. If you take into account all the, um, the raw input for the machines, distribution, the use, um, and that's surprising for us. So I think maybe we have to rethink what we're doing. Um, but the fact that we all need to sit down, we have only one world. And without being an activist, you know, I think we have to sit down and uh, consider how to improve this way we're working. We need to rethink our ways, how we deal with things. Why well, recycling in an era, in an hour might also be a solution. I agree with you yes. that it's not necessarily the most obvious solution that is the best solution. And I think it makes sense to intensify a little bit, uh, to think about it and find the best solution to, to sustain uh, our resources, which are not endless uh, for, for our planet and for our work. And thank you very much for yeah, joining you. us here. Yeah. And uh, it was a great pleasure to discuss uh, the future of urology. Thank you. And thank you very enjoy much. Enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.